on three did some Big 12 coaching rankings, and Sunny Dyke's kind of down the list. We'll talk about that next and what the Frogs have to do to get Sunny and the program back in a better position. This is Lockdown Horn Frogs. It's your team. We do it here every day. You are Locked On Horn Frogs. Your daily podcast on the TCU Horn Frogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Locked On Horn Frogs is your team every day. I'm your host, Steven. Some guys, subscribe to the YouTube channel. We're really close to 1,100 subscribers, which is really cool. Also, subscribe wherever it is you get your podcast in audio form. We're talking coaching rankings today. So, on three did their Big 12 coaching rankings for 2024. Sonny Dykes comes in at number seven. Now, there's 16 teams in the Big 12 now, as opposed to the 14 or the 10 that there were, you know, 10 a couple of years back, then expanded to 14. Now 16 teams in the league. Sonny is at number seven. The number one coach in the Big 12 is Kyle Whittingham. Lance Leipold at number two. Mike Gundy at three. Chris Kleiman at four. Gus Malzahn at five. Willie Fritz at six. And then Sonny Dykes comes in at number seven. And I spent a lot of time last offseason defending Sonny Dykes because I was pretty shocked coming off that great year at how many uh, publications and people were still what I thought were, were undervaluing him as a coach. He wasn't making a ton of appearances like in top 25 list. If he was, it was towards the bottom. We're talking about nationwide. We talked about the Big 12. He was still behind some guys like Chris Kleiman. Mike Gundy. And I understood it to a certain extent. Like I got the idea was the consistency was what was holding him back. And he had only had one season of power five football under his belt. But I kept coming back to the fact that he went to a playoff game, right? Like he went to a playoff game. He won a playoff game. That should mean something at the time in the big 12. Nobody had done that. Now Gus Malzahn has won a national title at Auburn. And so he's got that in his resume. But overall, these coaches, they don't uh, they don't have, you know, that kind of crown jewel that Sonny has, which is winning a playoff game. And I spent a lot of energy and time saying I think he's going to have a great year. And there were, you know, rankings about the programs in the Big 12, and I didn't feel like TCU was getting not proper respect. And they kind of fell in their face last year. And now we are uh, where we're at, where suddenly the, the pendulum has swung again. And – Last season, or, or two years ago, um, I, I thought Sonny did a really good job, or the team did a really good job, one of the two, of all the little things, right? The details, the middle toughness. Sonny used to wear a hoodie all the time that said details on it. And I thought at least in that first season at TCU, it really encapsulated what made that group so good. Yes, they won a lot of one-score games. And there are people that will just be like, well, there's some – variants to that there's just luck of the draw right coin flip 50 50 type games somehow they won all those ball games but I feel like anybody that actually watched that team they saw the mental toughness they saw the leadership and whether it was coming back against Oklahoma State at home after falling behind big or coming back against Kansas State at home after falling behind big making a, a huge um drive at the end of that Baylor game, executing to perfection to get in field goal position and then executing that field goal situation to perfection for Griffin Kill to kick a walk-off field goal to win that ball game at the buzzer. Um, You know, beating West Virginia on the road when that game got tight and they had to make some plays. In that Michigan game, when there were multiple instances where it looked like, okay, Michigan's got their footing now. They've got the momentum. They're going to go win this thing and big play or big drive by the offense, big stop by the defense. They had a knack for doing that. And I thought the defense was, it wasn't great, but they made good stops when they had to, they forced some turnovers and the team just did what they had to do. They were tough. They were physical. They had a clear identity. They made big plays and I kind of came to the conclusion that that's the type of identity that Sonny brings to the table. Because when he took the job, some of my concerns were like, man, I don't know if, I don't know if this team's going to be physical enough, if they're going to run the ball enough, if they're going to be tough enough. Because my perception of him 
with offensive minded guy, kind of finesse, right? You're trying to spread it out, uh, get matchups on offense, throw the ball around, fool the defense, not have them trust their eyes, those kind of things. And they did a lot of those things, but they also could run the ball when they had to. I thought they played tough physical football. They played good complementary football. And it ended up with them winning all those games. And then last season, it was just a complete 180. And you talk about, like, regression of the mean in some of those close games. It wasn't just regression of the mean. It was falling off a cliff. And Sonny talked about this throughout the year. Had a chance to go in that Colorado game, had the ball with a – opportunity to go tie it or win it couldn't do it had a chance to go win that West Virginia game late really the entire second half of the offense just could have put one decent drive together they probably won that football game couldn't do it lady in Texas Tech had a chance to go win that football game couldn't get it done against Texas you know on a third down if they get a stop in on that third down play, they get the ball back with an opportunity to go down and win that football game and get beat on a one-on-one matchup, that's the ball game, right? So 0-4 in one-score ball games. And there might be more instances. I'm not looking at the schedule right now, but that's just off the top of my head. Games that stood out to me where it was a play or two that really made the difference. And they did all those things a couple of years back, and they didn't do it last season. And so I'm – I'm very curious, as I know a lot of you are, to see what the team looks like this year. And in my mind, it's why there's a lot of pressure around the season. Because what what's going to be the more normal situation, right? Is it is it going to be the team that competes on a weekly basis, that handles getting punched in the mouth really well and can bounce back and make things happen, or is it the latter? And – one of the uh, one of the challenges with this now, as some of you pointed out, is with the transfer portal, you're just bringing in a lot of different players. And in TCU's case, at least the first couple of seasons of Sonny's tenure, maybe it'll change as he gets more established and hopefully brings in highly ranked high school recruiting classes on a regular basis. But at least for the first three years of his tenure, you're not only bringing a lot of guys in from the portal, you're expecting them and needing them to be key contributors right away. And it's the same case this year. You got your McAllister at receiver. You got a guy like Drake Dabney at your tight end position. A ton of new faces on defense. Reworked offensive line. And you're asking all these players to get here, buy in, quickly learn the system, and become key contributors for your team. And so that makes it more difficult to form a year-over-year identity and have success. And when we talk about the coaches that are at the top of this list, Kyle Whittingham, you know what Utah is going to do. They're going to hit you. They're going to play solid defense. They'll run the ball. And in most cases with Utah, it kind of comes down to what the quarterback play is going to be like as far as what their ceiling is. Last season, Cam Rising was hurt. So they had a musical chairs situation there. They still were able to, you know, scrap out seven wins. Chris Kleiman at Kansas State, same type of thing. Tough, physical, play solid defense, run the ball. And again, based on what athletes they have at key positions, based on who they got behind center, that's going to determine how far they can go. But there's a, a solid floor because of what they do on a consistent basis. Now, there's some guys on this list that I could really argue Sonny should be above. Willie Fritz is super well respected. I think that was a great hire by Houston. But he comes in at number six, and I get it. He's had a ton of success, had great success at Tulane. He's also been a group of five coach or, you know, JUCO small college coach for his whole career. So I think it's fair to maybe put him in the middle, like eight or nine, and expect him to do something in the Big 12 before we put him ahead of a guy like Sonny Dykes, who has shown that he's had some success. You know, Malzahn, I mean, it's it's tough to put Sonny above him because of his track record, but they are similar guys in that they've had some really high highs. But, you know, when the dust settles and um, it comes down to it, they're both coaches that have historically been between seven and nine wins most years. That's 
just what they've done on a consistent basis. And so we'll see what happens here at UCF. Gus will have a chance to um, – Gus will have a chance to prove that he can put together something more consistently, and Sonny will have that same opportunity here. Too. Also, I said Gus won a national title. That's not totally true. I mean, he did as an offensive coordinator. He's never won a national title as a head coach. He didn't make a national title game in 2014, but that was Gene Chizik, who was the the guy in 2010 when uh, Cam Newton was a QB and, and Auburn won it all. But bottom line, Gus has good pedigree, especially in this league now, and kind of similar in some ways to Sonny Dykes. But I think this is a, a pressure-filled year for the coaching staff and an opportunity for them to hopefully – show that a lot of the intangible qualities that the team possessed a couple of years back, that's going to be more normal for TCU football, that they are a tough team, a physical team, a team that can handle adversity and play at a high level even when things don't go their way. Because all the pre-snap penalties last year, all the mental mistakes, just the lack of execution, having to burn timeouts because you couldn't get lined up correctly, busted coverages, it just – it felt like a group that didn't have the same edge. And, I mean, he publicly kind of admitted it at times. After the Colorado game, he looked pretty shell-shocked. And he basically uh, was like, I don't think we were ready, you know. I don't feel like we were ready to rock and roll, which was pretty dumbfounding to me. But I, I, I think it was a team – I was hopeful that their mentality would be like, all right, we got close – but we saw we still got a long way to go, and let's figure this out. But instead, it seemed like the mentality was more like, you know, maybe we don't have to work as hard as we did a couple of years back because we got it figured out. And unfortunately, some of those games early in the year that could have been a wake-up call, it didn't really come to fruition. And it seemed like they finally started to get that back a little bit towards the end of the season, but it was too late, and they couldn't salvage what had already started, but I still believe in Sonny just for the record. Like there were in, in the middle of frustration last year, there were fans that reached out to me and were like, he's a bad coach. I don't think he's a bad coach. He's done a solid job just about everywhere he's been besides Cal. And there were some extenuating circumstances there that I feel like prevented him from reaching his full potential. But I think he's a good coach. I feel like he had a bad season and he would probably admit that, you know, he just didn't have, his finger on the pulse of the team as much as he should have last year. And that led to some issues. And hopefully those things are getting corrected and they're getting back to what they were a couple of years ago. Um, when we come back, we're going to talk about the transfer portal, TCU basketball. They're hosting a few players this weekend. That's coming up here on Lockdown Horn Frogs, your team every day. If you need parts, for your car. You can't mess around with your vehicle. It's your ride. You got to get to and from, you know, every day. Like, there's few things more frustrating for me than if I go out to my car and it won't start up. Or I, I feel like I have car issues. Because, like, all right, how am I going to get my kids to school? How do I get to work? I got to switch car seats around. I got to get this to a, a shop. Like, you don't want to be in that situation. So, if there's some regular car maintenance that you can do, why not do it through someone you trust, like eBay Motors? Passion, drive, and patience. That's the formula for winning champions. Championships is also what keeps your ride alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle or level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. Over 122 million parts for your ride. You'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. All the parts you need at the prices you want. It's easy to make your car at the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions do apply. That eBay guaranteed fit system is only for U.S. customers. eBay Motors, proud sponsor of the Locked On Network. So if you missed it uh, a few days back, TCU has landed a commitment. TCU basketball has landed a commitment for uh, the 2024 class from the transfer portal. C.J. Walker, UCF forward, uh, averaged about seven points and five rebounds last year for the Knights. Started his career at Oregon, played three seasons at UCF, and is now coming over to TCU. Seems like a, a really athletic guy, plays good defense, can crash the boards, can score a little bit. 
uh, a good rotational piece for this team. So at the moment, Micah Peavy, Jacoby Coles in the portal, they're leaving, supposedly. So if the season started today, Ernest Uday, C.J. Walker, Jace Posey, Isaiah Manning, your true freshman, and that's it. So need more people on this team, obviously, and that is basketball in the transfer portal era. So what are they going to do? Well, they do have a couple of players visiting, according to Jamie Plunkett from Horn Frog Blitz of the 247 Sports Network. Uh, Frankie Collins from Arizona State will be in town this weekend. Frankie averaged 13 points a game and four assists per game this past year. Not a super efficient season shooting the basketball. 31% from three. Uh, 42% from the field. I shot about 42% from the field for the majority of his career. Did shoot 33% from three back in 2022. Um, his assist, his turnover assist ratio also uh, kind of went down last year. So it seems like if you're asking him to run the offense and distribute and be more of a true point guard, that's a role that he could fit in and play well in. Uh, if you're asking him to score – at a high rate or be a, be a volume score. That's not really something you want, but as far as somebody who could come in and run the offense, I think Frankie Collins would be a good fit. You need guards to replace what you're losing that production. And so he will be a target for TCU this weekend. Another player that the frogs are hosting is Noah Reynolds. And I'm really excited about Noah. He averaged 20 points a game last year for green Bay um, in four and a half assists. So did a nice job handling the ball, passing it, and shooting it. Also played a few years at Wyoming, two years back at Wyoming, averaged 14 points a game, um, but 34% from three, 51% shooting from the field. Was a 48% shooter from the field uh, in 2022 at Wyoming and about 30% from three again. But a guy that can fill it up and could be kind of your leader as a scorer, as a shooter, and hopefully someone who can space the floor for you moving forward. So Noah Reynolds and Frankie Collins visiting for the basketball team this weekend. Uh, some more Big 12 basketball news. Scott Drew staying at Baylor. He got some overtures from Kentucky, uh, but ended up deciding he was going to stay in Waco. So he will be coaching in the Big 12 still. Mark Pope, BYU's coach, appears he's finalizing a deal to go to Kentucky. So the Cougars We'll have a new coach in 2024. Um, frogs continue to work the portal. Got to get some commitments here soon. Start building this team again. But I like Noah Reynolds. That would be you know, priority number one for me. I think Frankie Collins can be a good piece of this puzzle as well. Again, it's just kind of depending on what you're asking him to do, what kind of expectations you have for him. But those are the guys the Frogs are bringing in. Uh, for visits this upcoming weekend out of the transfer portal in basketball. TCU baseball, they take on Texas Tech. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, all those games in Fort Worth, Texas, which is good news because, uh, you know, Lubbock, that's a park that plays small, and they can always hit the baseball. So fun that they're at home, but this is a TCU baseball team that is struggling right now. They are 5-10 and 10 in conference play. They play uh, tonight at 6.30, Saturday at 3, and Sunday at 1 o'clock. And as far as, you know, postseason chances go and postseason opportunities go, it feels like this is we're we're in real must win territory now. I mean, you have you have used up all the all the mulligans, all the opportunities you had to start turning this thing around. It has to turn around right now. now. Now the good thing about Big 12 baseball is that it's kind of a mess at the moment. Everybody's jumbled up together. I mean, your leader at the at the time is is West Virginia, who's eight and four in conference play. Texas Tech is eight and seven in conference play. If you win some games this weekend, all of a sudden you're right back in this thing. But it has to start, you know, this Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Um, right now at the moment they wouldn't even qualify for the Big 12 tournament because they're second to last in the league, only in front of Houston, who they swept a couple weekends ago. But, yeah, turnaround's got to start now. Texas Tech 8-7 and seven in conference play. So not your typical Tim Tadlock team, but obviously having a much better season than TCU so far this year. And so – uh, Frogs are going to have an uphill battle against a Tech team that can always mash. But those games, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, tonight at 6.30, expecting – don't know who's going to go on Sunday, but expect uh, Peyton Tolle and then Luis Rodriguez to be your guys on Friday, Saturday, maybe you know by committee again on Sunday as TCU still tries to kind of figure out what this uh, 
what this pitching staff is going to look like moving forward. When we come back, I'll get to some of your reactions from our recent shows. It's Locked on Horn Frogs, your team. We do it here every day. Game time, best place to get tickets. If you need tickets, especially at the last minute, they have flash deals, um, all kinds of sales for you. Game time, use the promo code Locked on College for $20 off. But if you're more of a planner and you want to get tickets, you know, a few days or weeks before the event, you can do that at game time as well. It shows you a picture of the seat, like, or a picture of your view from your seat when you buy the ticket. Also, you can uh, see exactly what your fees are going to be and how much you're going to pay to get those tickets sent directly to your phone. Mobile delivery, so you don't have to worry about where are they going. Game time. Locked on college is the promo code to get $20 off. I make it simple for you. I make it easy for you. It's the best place to get tickets on the secondary market. Use the game time app today. Again, that promo code locked on college for $20 off your next order. So actually I actually had Drake Toll on the show on Thursday or on Wednesday. We encourage you to check that out. If you haven't, we talked about Big 12 realignment. We also talked about uh, his favorites in the Big 12 conference where he thinks TCU stands in the power rankings, the way too early power rankings um, before the season starts. And then a few days ago, I did a show where I made some bold predictions for TCU football. I talked about how I thought Cam Cook was going to rush for 1,000 yards. I discussed how I felt like um, – Haas Haney was going to be a part of this offense, not the starter, but he was going to be part of what TCU was doing on the offensive side of the ball. And also I thought Paul Lawale would lead the team in sacks. And so some of you had reactions to that. Um, let's see. Tanner McKinney says, I agree. Cam Cook will go over 1,000 yards this season. The only issue is the O-line needs some work. And he thinks the sack leader will be Shad Banks or Jonathan Bax. He's hoping Haas gets some game time. They need, that, he says the Frogs need a running QB or, uh, you know, they can use them in some other ways. Um, yeah, I, I like all that stuff. I know you're a big Cam Cook fan, so I, I I agree. I think he can have a big season. And mainly I'm just predicting that based on the fact that he's going to be the lead back. I think he's going to get a lot, ton of opportunities this year. And I feel like the offensive line is going to be better. I don't know if it's going to be, you know, completely – turned around, but I think it's going to be better than it was last season. Matt Clark said that's definitely a bold prediction for a guy that has 16 carries for 58 yards. He's more in line with an idea of Cook having 700 yards and Palmer paying with another 300. Um, he thinks uh, maybe I was on something when I was making that Cam Cook prediction. Well, you know, I mean, listen, it's it's a bold prediction for a reason. I'll say this. Amani Bailey had a really good season last year, and he wasn't somebody who had had a ton of college production before that. Now, he had a good – year at Louisiana a few seasons before that and his first year at TCU he made some things happen you know at the end of games he was featured some uh when Kendra and Amari were out but he was still kind of a surprise and kind of an unknown so I don't think it's totally out of their own possibility to believe that that Cam can turn this around and, and find a way to get it done CJ asked the Arkansas running back coach Jimmy Smith who just came over to TCU does he like to use one guy or uh, go by committee at running back? I was looking into this. It's a good question. Um, so last season, it was definitely by committee. You know, they they ran the ball with a lot of different guys. A.J. Green um, and Rashad DeBond had the most carries. DeBond had 82 carries. A.J. Green had 67. Raheem Sanders had 62 carries. But K.J. Jefferson actually had the most carries on the team with 161. Um, two years ago, it was really Raheem Sanders – who carried the rock the most, but it's kind of hard to tell because KJ Jefferson was such a huge part of their rushing attack the last few years. That's obviously going to be different than what you see at TCU, but it seems like, like most people, CJ, it's, it's kind of based on personnel. Like if he has a clear lead back, then he'll use that guy. But if, uh, if he doesn't, then it'll be more by committee. So I think it'll just depend on how this running back room shakes out. And if anybody emerges as, a clear lead back this upcoming season. Enjoy the baseball games this weekend. We'll be back on Monday. It's Locked on Horn Frogs, your team every day.